Hello, welcome to this evening's event, Neuropedia, a brief compendium of brain phenomena. Uh, my name is Daniel Baker. I'm a senior lecturer in the Department of Psychology here at the University of York, and I'm going to be chairing uh, this evening's session. Now, it's a very great pleasure to introduce our speaker today. Eric H. Chudler is a research neuroscientist at the University of Washington, um, where he is in the Departments of Bioengineering, Anesthesiology, and Pain Medicine. He's primarily interested in how the central nervous system processes information about pain. And in addition to performing neuroscience research, Eric works with other neuroscientists and classroom teachers to develop educational materials to help students learn about the brain. His website, Neuroscience for Kids, is used by students and teachers around the world. Um, and he's also published a book, which he's uh, going to be talking about today. I've got my copy here. It's called Neuropedia, um, a brief compendium of brain phenomena. So today, Eric is going to be exploring the mysteries and marvels of the three pounds of tissue between our ears, the brain. OK, over to you, Eric. Thank you very much uh, for inviting me and for that uh, kind introduction, Daniel. Uh, today, I will be talking about the brain, uh, a bit about neuroscience. I wanted to thank the York Festival Ideas for inviting me to participate today, and also Princeton University Press, who is the publisher of my book, Neuropedia. I'm coming to you this morning, I know it's the evening for most of you, uh, from Seattle, Washington, in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, what you see in the screen in front of you is a picture of downtown Seattle. It's a nice sunny day. If any of you have visited Seattle before, you know that we're known for our rain, but summertime is really the nicest time. I think uh, one of the nicest places in the world, I think, uh, for the summertime. Uh, so I am a uh, professor in the departments of bioengineering and also in anesthesiology and pain medicine at the University of Washington here in Seattle. I'm also the executive director of the Center for Neurotechnology. And what we're going to do today is I'll talk a little bit about who I am so you get an idea of the type of questions that I can answer for you. Uh, I'll talk a bit about what the promise of neuroscience is. Why do we do neuroscientific research and some of the developments? And we'll then talk about brain uh, basics. Uh, I know from the York Festival ideas that there is a range of people that are in the audience today. There may be some children, there may be some adults, I know that you probably all come with a different background about what you know about the brain, and we'll try to get everyone on the, the same page by talking about how nerve cells work, <clears throat> different parts of the brain, and we'll do some interactive activities as well to get you to know your brain a bit more. And then we'll end with some questions or answers. So just a little bit more about myself. Uh, I was born in Los Angeles, but I did elementary school in Malaysia. And I went to high school in Japan. Both of my parents were school teachers. Uh, they really didn't know much about science, so they didn't have much guidance for me when it came to my education when I was interested in science. But uh, I liked to go to the beach a lot, and I thought that maybe I could get a, a job at the beach, maybe a, a marine biologist or something like that. My dad was a little bit scared that maybe I would become a lifeguard instead of a, uh, something else, but I decided to go to uh, UCLA for my undergraduate work. And back in the 1970s, neuroscience was just really beginning. They really didn't have any neuroscience departments. And so instead, what I selected as my major as an undergraduate was psychobiology. And as you can expect from that word, it's a combination between psychology and biology. So I took courses in the psychology department, also in the department of biology. And I also had a chance to work in a laboratory that was investigating how the brain responds in times of stress. And in times of stress, a particular brain chemical is released called the endorphins. And these are chemicals that reduce an organism's uh, perception of pain. And when it was time to graduate from UCLA, the professor who uh, I was working with said, what are you going to do uh, after you graduate from college? And I said, I, I don't know, what are you supposed to do? And he said, well, there's this thing called graduate school. And I said, oh, graduate school, what's, what's that? And he said, well, you go to school for about five or six more years and you can become a, a professor. 
I said, go to school for five or six more years. You know, it took me 12 years to get out of high school, four years in college. What if I want to go to college or, or more classes for five or six more years? And he said, don't worry, uh, that's mainly research. And I decided to go to the University of Washington for my doctorate degree. So I, I drove up to Seattle. And then after I got my PhD, I drove across country to Washington, D.C., where I worked at the National Institute of Health in a dental institute, but I'm not a dentist. And then I went up to Boston where I was in the Department of Neurosurgery, but I'm not a neurosurgeon. And then back uh, about uh, 30 years ago or so, I took a faculty job at the University of Washington where I am now. And as you heard in the introduction, uh, my appointments are in anesthesiology and pain medicine and bioengineering. So that's just a bit about my history. So I'm not a clinician. I don't work with patients. so. Uh, please, during the question and answer, I, I can't answer any personal health or medical questions. I'm not a medical doctor. Rather, I'm a basic scientist. I'm a neuroscientist who studies the brain. And what I do in the lab right now, in addition to being interested in, in pain and how the brain processes information from the outside world, I'm very interested in neuroregeneration. And the model that I use in my lab are these little animals that you see there on the lower left side. Those are planaria. Planaria have a fantastic ability to regenerate themselves. Uh, you can cut them and they regenerate their tissue. And in fact, in two weeks, they can completely regenerate their entire body. And so I'm interested in how these animals can do that, uh, how they can reorganize their nervous systems after injury, and perhaps know more about how different drugs or chemicals can affect their development. That might give us an idea about how humans develop and about some of the dangers of chemicals or drugs on the developing nervous system. So that's what I'm doing in the lab right now. I mentioned that I'm also the executive director of the Center for Neurotechnology. What we're doing here is we're trying to develop new techniques to help people who have suffered damage to their nervous systems. For example, from stroke, where the brain has its blood supply uh, cut off or blocked or blood vessel can break. Uh, these people who have suffered a stroke might lose the ability to move. Uh, another problem that's quite common is people who have suffered from a spinal cord injury. It could be from a motorcycle accident or a fall where the brain might be perfectly fine, but because the brain is no longer connected to the rest of the body because of an injury to the spinal cord, a person's commands to move won't get through to the muscles, so a person becomes paralyzed. And also, a person who has damage to the spinal cord may not be able to feel anything, because again, that pathway from the body to the brain is cut off. And so we're trying to find maybe a wearable uh, method or an implantable method that might take a person's thoughts or intentions to help a people move again and to feel again. And so we're looking at ways that the brain rewires itself after injury and how we can cause that rewiring to actually benefit people and create new therapies. Neuroscientific research has great potential to help people, and it can do so in a variety of ways. One, um, there are many new drug therapies for psychiatric and neurological disease. So neuroscientists around the world are developing ways to help people who have either disorders or damage to their nervous systems. Uh, we've made great progress developing new drug therapies. We don't know exactly how some of these therapies work, but we've made great progress helping people with psychiatric and neurological disease. We've also discovered many surgical techniques that have helped people with neurological disorders. These, some of the newer techniques have to do with um, implanting electrodes into the brain to help uh, people. For example, for Parkinson's disease. Parkinson's disease is caused by a particular destruction of uh, neurons in the brain that contain a neurotransmitter or chemical called dopamine. When about 70 to 80% of those dopamine containing neurons are lost, a person has a movement problem. Well, you can help people with uh, Parkinson's disease by implanting an electrode into the brain that when electrical stimulation is turned on, a person's movement disorder actually disappears. It's, it's quite remarkable to see how this type of therapy can, can benefit someone. 
So there are new surgical treatments that are being involved, that are being developed. And another development that has really revolutionized neuroscientific research is diagnostics through brain imaging. You may have heard techniques called of uh, PET scans or MRI scans. PET uh, stands for positron emission tomography. Uh, MRI is magnetic resonance imaging. These are ways that scientists, researchers, and clinicians can see the living brain, the working living brain, especially with something called functional MRI. So these are all uh, fantastic developments, new technologies that are coming out of labs all the time, helping people who have suffered from disease. And I think it's important that not only experts should learn about how the brain works, because neuroscience and brain research is going to affect all of us. And uh, the reason why I say that is because Unfortunately, we will probably all know someone who's been affected by neurological disease or psychiatric disease. So there's a tremendous emotional cost onto someone. Uh, taking care of someone who has Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's disease, uh, not only the person who has that disease, but families, friends, caretakers, it takes a tremendous toll on people who have suffered from these diseases. And it's expensive as well. So it's important that we all know more about how uh, the brain works. I think it's important that we all know about the brain because in many places, it's required that students learn about the brain. And so by knowing more about the brain, students can perform better in the classroom. And not only that, perhaps if teachers knew more about how the brain learns and remembers, perhaps we can develop new ways for people to learn and new techniques to teach. It's a bit controversial. Uh, there hasn't been a lot of study about applying neuroscientific research directly to the classroom, but there are groups around the world that are, that are looking into that. Perhaps, again, if we knew about how the brain learned and memorized, maybe we can develop some new techniques to help us uh, teach better. Many people would like to have successful careers, and there are many jobs available if people knew more about neuroscience, not only as medical professionals, not only as academic researchers, but there are careers in law or writing. Uh, so there are many different uh, career opportunities for people who know more about the brain. And finally, I think that if people knew more about the brain, maybe it would change their lifestyle. And what I mean by this is that we know that there are certain lifestyle uh, choices that can benefit the brain. For example, we know that exercise not only is good for your heart, but exercise is good for your brain as well. If people knew more about that, perhaps we could get them out uh, exercising. Uh, not only physical exercise, but mental exercise as well. We know that exercising your brain mentally also benefits brain health. If people knew more about that, maybe they would take up uh, you know, uh, more mental exercise. Now, we don't have a prescription for mental exercise. We don't know exactly uh, what that means for mental exercise, but we know that in general, people that are more mentally active, their brains stay in better shape. The same thing goes for diet uh, and also maybe other lifestyle choices like uh, drugs and uh, things like that. So I think that uh, it's important that we all know more about how the brain works because there are pressures from our families who are suffering from disease. Uh, there are societal pressures on us and many educational systems are requiring that students learn more about their brain. So that's why I think it's very important that we all know about how the brain works. There was a study that was done just last summer by the Dana Foundation here in the US that asked people if they knew someone or if they themselves had suffered from a brain disorder. And as you can see here in this slide, 82% of the people said yes, that they knew someone who had experienced at least one brain disorder or mental health condition. So this goes to show just how common neurological and psychiatric disease is in our society. So it's very, very important, I think, that we all know more about the brain so that I, we don't have to all become neuroscientists. We do not have to all become uh, physicians, but we do know, we must know about how the brain works so we can help these people perhaps 
uh, deal with their condition, perhaps help them ask their doctors and caregivers the right questions so that they can get the care that they need. Uh, this is another slide that just shows how one particular disorder, dementia, is going to sk be skyrocketing. Uh, by the year 2040, uh, dementia, cases of dementia around the world are just going to skyrocket. As our population gets older, unless we develop new therapies and treatments, uh, this is going to be an epidemic of uh, dementia. Uh, and this is just one example. Stroke is another example that is uh, increasing at extraordinary levels. In fact, with, with, there's one estimate that, uh, that suggests that uh, stroke, almost 25% of the population will have suffered a stroke uh, as they get older. So um, it's extremely important that not only we find cures and treatments for these disorders, but that we become more aware of these problems so that we can help people who have suffered these problems. I mentioned societal issues. Uh, neuroscience is creeping into our legal system. Uh, it's creeping into other aspects of our lives by how we define death, how we define life, how we treat people with drug abuse and, and mental health issues. Uh, so uh, I think for people to weigh in on these issues, it's important that they know the facts uh, and they can separate fact from fiction so that they can have a, a reasonable say on many of these issues that they may be facing in their own lives. But sometimes neuroscience gets, uh, and what scientists and researchers can do, sometimes gets in front of the societal issues that will be caused by their work. And what I mean by that, I, I mentioned brain imaging. So we have ways that we can mention, that we can measure how the brain is responding. But what would happen and who should have access to those data? For example, if there was a brain scan that could tell whether a person was lying or not, not telling the truth, should that be given to people before they get a job? Should you let an employer scan your brain? Uh, maybe a brain scan would tell whether a person was going to develop a disease later in the future. Would that impact uh, a person's ability to get hired by that particular job. Is that fair? Uh, what about um, uh, parents who might want to scan their, their children's brains? Uh, is, is that a, a fair thing to do? Uh, other labs are developing drugs to make people quote unquote smarter, smart drugs, also called uh, neurotropics. Uh, should those be used by people, for example, before they take a test or an examination? Or would that be cheating? For example, in the Olympics, uh, we have laws and there are regulations that if someone is caught doping, uh, maybe taking steroids or other drugs, that they're banned from the Olympics and they won't be able to participate. What about a drug that could make someone smarter? Uh, is that fair or would that be cheating? Or, or do we already have these things? For example, I enjoy a, a cup of coffee in the morning that makes me more alert. Uh, is that, uh, should that be something that, that should be banned? Uh, other things, uh, labs around the world are developing drugs to alter personality or maybe even remove selective memories. And you might think to yourself, well, why would someone want a memory removed? Well, some people unfortunately have experienced a very traumatic experience. And that traumatic experience is played over and over in someone's head. And sometimes it's so severe that a person can't function in society. Well, what if you could selectively remove that memory? Would that be a good thing or a bad thing? Some people would say, well, that would be a, a good thing because the person won't remember that, won't focus on that event. Other people would say, no, that would be very bad because that might lead to that person getting back into that same situation that caused that traumatic event in the first place. So you shouldn't be allowed to do that. So there are all these different uh, uh, ethics that are being, and ethical issues that are arising due to much of the basic research that is being done. And oftentimes, these ethical issues are not being discussed by the people that they'll be affecting. So even though scientists and researchers can do certain things, the question is, should they be doing those things? And I think it's not just up to scientists and researchers who should weigh in. On, on these issues. 
And it's, an, it's very difficult. Uh, I think for just the general public to pick up a magazine or a newspaper and not see something about the brain. So I think it's very important. There's a lot of misinformation going around, lots of myths about the brain. And so I think just a basic understanding about how the brain works is very important for us just to be able to pick up a newspaper or a magazine and be able to evaluate that information critically because there are a lot of brain myths. My two favorite brain myths are those last two that you see here on the screen, that is, uh, how much uh, of the brain do we use? Oftentimes when I ask people, they say, oh, we only use 10% of the brain. Uh, that's actually a myth. There's no part of the brain that's sitting there doing nothing. Uh, certainly when you're doing different things, different parts of the brain are more or less active, but there's no part of the brain that's sitting there doing nothing. Certainly uh, nothing like a 10%. Uh, you know, if you remove 90% of the brain, certainly you would not be you. Uh, my other favorite myth is the full moon. Many people believe that when the full moon comes out, there's a lot more abnormal behavior. Uh, and that's actually not true. Uh, you can uh, look at the literature. Uh, I've, I've actually looked at more than 100 different studies that have been published in the peer-reviewed literature. And there's almost no evidence that the phase of the moon causes any more abnormal behavior, such as uh, suicide, murders, traffic accidents, uh, domestic violence. Um, there's really no correlation between the, the full moon and abnormal behavior. And, and certainly it does not cause uh, werewolves. Uh, but uh, yet a lot of people still believe that the moon causes abnormal behavior. And uh, you, the people that believe it the most are very educated people, police officers, medical personnel, they have the strongest belief that the full moon actually influences behavior. But in fact, when you look at the data, there's very little evidence, almost no evidence that the full moon causes any abnormal behavior. So again, I think it's very important that we all know more about the brain so that we can get rid of uh, some of these brain myths. And you might think to yourself, well, what's wrong with uh, believing that the full moon causes uh, more abnormal behavior or some other, you know, what's wrong with saying that the, you want to use 10% of the brain? Well, the reason for that is that we, by believing some of these myths, they might take away from resources where they should go. For example, a few years ago, and I believe it's actually a, a police department near York, uh, Sheffield, I, I'm not exactly sure where Sheffield is, but a few years ago, the police chief in Sheffield uh, uh, learned or read somewhere that the full moon caused more crime. And so what this police chief in Sheffield did was he put more police officers on the street during the times of the full moon. And do you think arrests went up? Well, of course they went up because his officers were told there's going to be more crime. So he put more officers on the street and there, yes, there were more arrests, but that is... Uh, not because of the full moon affecting it. Well, it's affecting the, the behavior of the police chief, but it's not affecting the people that were committing those crimes. So uh, again, the problem with believing things that are not true is that it's a waste of resources, uh, people's time, uh, people's money and energy. So let's get uh, into a, a bit about uh, the brain. Now, uh, this is kind of the interactive part portion of my talk. As some of you who may be familiar with the brain, uh, this is my little brain model here, uh, and I, we, I, we don't really have a way to do too much interaction, but you can just, if there's someone sitting next to you, or even if you're yourself, uh, tell uh, that person or tell yourself if you know what this outside part of the brain is called. What is the name of this outside part? Uh, it's this top arrow that's pointing uh, to this wrinkled part, which is covering the outside. Uh, you might know the name. The name of this outside area of the brain is called the cortex or the cerebral cortex. And cortex comes from a Latin word meaning bark, not of a dog, but of a tree, because it's kind of that outside rind. It's that outside covering of the brain. And it's folded like that, so you can get a large surface area into the relatively small volume of your skull. So that's why you see all those folds on the skull. Uh, the second area here, if anybody knows that, you can think to yourself or tell uh, the person sitting next to you, this area of the brain, this, this arrow is pointing to in the middle of the brain, that's the thalamus. And then below the thalamus is the hypothalamus that is here. 
Uh, this general area, uh, sort of toward the back uh, of the brain, is called the midbrain. This thing that looks like a cauliflower, this is again the front, this is the back. Uh, below uh, the cortex here, the, this area here is called the cerebellum, which comes from a Latin word meaning little brain. You can kind of see it looks like a little brain at the, uh, there. That's the cerebellum, very important for balance, posture, keeping movement smooth. And then from about uh, this area here to the top of the spinal cord, which would be the, the bottom of the brain here, to the top of the spinal cord, this would be the brain stem. So those are all just uh, some of the areas that you may have heard of. Um, they all come from Greek and Latin words. So learning neuroanatomy is Greek and Latin uh, <clears throat> because that's where these words originate from. And let's talk a little bit about how big the brain is and if there are any differences between brain size between uh, men and women. So think to yourself, here are your answers on this slide. Uh, does the average human brain weigh about one, three, five, or seven pounds? Uh, three pounds is about 1.4 kilograms. Uh, so how much do you think the average brain weighs? I'll give you about uh, five seconds to come up with an answer. On average, an average adult human brain weighs about three pounds. That's about 1.4 kilograms. And what about differences between men and women, boys and girls? Are there any differences between how much a brain weighs? For example, uh, male and female brains weigh the same, or maybe you think, well, male brains are bigger, or maybe female brains weigh more than male. What do you think? You have a little time to think about that. What do you think? A, B, or C. Male and female brains weigh the same. Male brains weigh more. Female brains weigh more. The answer is shown here on this slide. Here's a graph that shows on the x-axis uh, how old someone is. So a newborn baby is on the left. Someone who's 86 years old is on the right. In uh, on the y-axis is brain weight. 1.4 kilograms is about here. In red are male brain weights, and in blue are female brain weights. And I think what you can see in this graph is that on average, male brains weigh about 10% more than female brains. I once showed this graph to a group of uh, young children. They were about 10 years old. And they looked at this graph and they saw that the red bars were bigger than the blue bars. And when I called on one small boy and I asked what this graph shows, uh, the little boy said to me, this graph shows that men are smarter than women. And I said, uh, no, this graph doesn't really say anything about how smart someone is. All this graph shows is how much a brain weighs. It says nothing about a person's intelligence. It says nothing about a person's personality. And I showed this graph, uh, and then I showed this graph. And the young kids had a little bit of trouble understanding this graph, but I'm sure that you won't have any problem at all. What this graph shows is how much the brain is weighs in proportion to the rest of the body. So this is brain body ratio. So if my brain weighs three pounds and my body weighs 150 pounds, that means my brain weighs 2% of my total body weight. And that's what you can see here for age, that for adults, your brain is about 2% of your total body weight. And you can see that when people get above the uh, teenage years, that women have a larger brain in proportion to their body than men. But even this graph doesn't say anything about intelligence. Uh, if you look here on the left, a newborn baby, a newborn baby's brain is about 13% of their total body weight. So uh, I don't think that most of you will say, well, just because uh, a baby has a brain that's 13% of how much they weigh, that they're smarter than you. So just by looking at absolute brain weight, looking at relative brain weight, says nothing about a person's intelligence. And we humans, we do not have the largest brains on earth. Uh, there are several animals, uh, elephants, uh, whales, they have larger brains than us. And we're also not the animals that have the larger brains in proportion to our bodies. There are some animals that have larger brain body ratios than us. One animal is a hummingbird. Hummingbirds, they weigh almost nothing. Their brains are very small. But when you do the math, when you look at how much their brain is in proportion to the body, 
Hummingbirds have larger brains for their body size than humans. And we'll do this really, really quickly, but I just wanted to show you some images of some other brains from other animals because we were just talking about that. And you can see some similarities between these six brains, A, B, C, D, E, and F, uh, belong to those animals that you see there on the left. Uh, they're uh, either a cat, sheep, human, monkey, dolphin, or chimpanzee brain. And I put B, D, and F, those photographs, one on top of the other, because you can see some similarities between them. And in fact, uh, a, uh, B, D, and F, are the chimpanzee, human, and monkey brains. And you can see that they have very similar locations of their cerebellum, uh, the lobes of the brain that some of you may have heard about, the frontal lobe, the temporal lobe, the parietal lobe, and the occipital lobe. You can kind of see those very easily on these three brains, while the animals on the left side are a little bit more strange, or maybe not strange, but maybe less human-like. How about that? Uh, the cat brain is a lot smaller, but has a very large cerebellum, maybe because they have a very good uh, ability to balance. Uh, dolphins have a very large brain. It's very, the cortex is very thin, but their brains are very convoluted, very folded. And a sheep brain, um, one thing that's very interesting about the sheep brain is you can tell that it walks on four legs, because look how the spinal cord is lined up with the plane of the rest of the brain showing that the animal walks on four legs because the spinal cord exits uh, directly uh, to the back. Well, for us humans, and uh, our spinal cord has to bend all the way down our spinal cord because we walk on, on two legs. So I don't know how many of you were able to match those six brains with the six animals uh, because we did this very, very quickly. But our brains are mainly water, uh, about 10% uh, fat, uh, so if someone calls you a fat head, you should say thank you, because fat is very important for a, a proper operation of your brain. And we've got a couple of special cells. Uh, not only do we have nerve cells, but we have glial cells that are very important to support some of the functions of our nerve cells. They help speed up the electrical signals, uh, and they're mainly fat as well. I talked about neurons as being one of those very important cells. They have these special uh, components and very special parts called dendrites, which receive information from other cells. I made a little model neuron here. Uh, in white are dendrites, which are receiving information from other cells. They send information to the green part, which is called the cell body or the soma. And then information travels down an axon, which is this orange part. And then the electrical signal comes to the end at the terminal. And you have a whole lot of nerve cells in your brain. Uh, what do you think? 86 million, 860 million, 8.6 billion, or 86 billion? What do you think? The answer is that one human brain can accommodate about 86 billion nerve cells. That's a lot. Uh, that's a lot of, of cells. Of course, they're really, really small. Uh, and each of those nerve cells uh, is like a little battery is like uh, in that they generate a little bit of an electrical signal, not the same kind of electricity that comes out of the wall socket, uh, but rather it's an exchange of ions, uh, of, of chemical uh, uh, ions. And that's what creates this electrical signal that is transmitted down the axon. And the interesting thing is that for two cells, two neurons to communicate with each other, it's not the electrical signal that jumps from one neuron to another neuron. Rather, when an electrical signal gets to the end of the terminal, it causes a chemical to be released. That chemical is picked up by the next nerve cell in line, which will either increase or decrease the likelihood that that next nerve cell will generate its own electrical signal. And that's how your brain works. So if there's nothing else uh, from my talk today that uh, you uh, can remember, Remember that the brain works on electrical signals inside of a nerve cell and chemical signaling between nerve cells. And we're all walking and talking laboratories uh, which we can test our sensory abilities. And so we're going to do uh, a couple of those. And so on this one right here, and this one is in the book as well, uh, but it should work for you as well. So what I want you to do is I want you to close your right eye. And with your left eye, I want you to look across at that screen and you see the happy face inside that rectangle. 
if you look only, so again, close your right eye, look across at the happy face. And for me, when I do this right now, the sad face disappears. It's just completely gone. If it's not gone for you, move back and forth from your screen a little bit. And you should see that sad face just completely disappear. And it's not because this is some kind of a magic screen or anything like that, but rather the reason why this is happening is that when you close one eye and you look across at that happy face, even though you're not looking at the sad face, that sad face there is being reflected into your eye. And when you get to the exact right spot, it is being focused on your optic nerve at the back of your retina. And that's a part of your retina with no photoreceptors. And so that's why it disappears because that light from the sad face is landing on a part of your retina with no receptors for light. And so your brain just fills it in with what it expects to be there, which is just that, that white background. Um, this is another uh, illusion that uh, psychologists and neuroscientists use to study how the brain just tries to help you. You may see in this picture uh, a white triangle, an upside down triangle with the point to the bottom. But in fact, there is no triangle here. The triangle is being completely made up by your brain. Because if I take away those black lines, that white triangle disappears. So I know that when I created this slide, I only drew black lines. I never drew a white triangle. It's your brain that's filling in and helping you uh, see that triangle. Here's one more that I, I, want, I want to try with you. And uh, what I want you to do here is stare at that red X right at the center. So stare right at the center for about 10 seconds. Keep on staring there. Just keep on staring. I'm going to count backwards from 10, and then uh, just I'll, we'll see what you see. Keep on staring at that red triangle. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Keep on looking. And you should see a kind of a greenish blue X with a red background instead of what you were just looking at, which was there in the lower left, which was a red X. Uh, and the reason why you should be seeing that kind of a greenish blue X with a red background is that when you stared at this object, your brain is adapting to those colors. So when you look then at the white after that adaptation, your brain is trying to process white minus that red X and green background, and your brain interprets it as that green or bluish X with a red background. And I just want to do one more with you, and then we'll, we'll have time for some, some uh, questions. Your brain is just trying to help. Uh, it's just trying to make sense of the world. Uh, it's trying to use what it knew from experience, what things should be. Uh, your brain always doesn't, doesn't always get things correct. But in these two lines, even though you can't read the top sentence and the bottom sentence because half of it I think that you'll be able to see that that top line, uh, this line here, uh, it seems to say, I love school. I think that you would agree that that's what it says. And the second line at the bottom here, even though you can't see everything, I think that you should be able to read it as neuroscience is fun, right? Well, is that really true? Are you sure that's what it says? Because it actually doesn't say that at all. It's just some letters that help you prime your brain to be able to read. So again, this is what it looks like to you. It sure looks like to me that that top line says, I love school, and the bottom line says neuroscience for fun. It's just your brain trying to help you make sense of the world, but it doesn't always get things right. So I hope you've enjoyed uh, learning more about the brain. I think it's real important that you take precautions to protect your brain, doing some of those things that we talked about, uh, like uh, mental and physical exercise. Sleep is, very all, is also very, very important to keep your brain in tip-top shape. Protecting your brain by wearing helmets when you're uh, bicycling and doing other activities. It's relatively easy to do things to protect your brain. Once your brain is damaged, it's more, much more difficult to fix brains once they're damaged. So I, I hope that you'll all take precautions, do everything you can do, to protect your brain and to keep it into in, in tip-top shape. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Eric. Um, I'm sure everyone in the audience enjoyed that presentation as much as I did. It was very wide ranging and, uh, and, and interesting. So we do have some questions now in the Q&A. The first one then is from Rima, uh, who says, thank you very much for your presentation. Is there any book in addition to yours, which I've read and thoroughly enjoyed, that you could recommend exactly about pain and neurology? This topic does appear to be both useful and utterly fascinating. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, yes, uh, there are a number of books. Um, there in the back of my in the back of Neuropedia, the book I do reference some books and some websites where you can get more information about that. Uh, I'm trying to think of a of a book specifically about pain. Uh, for the general audience, and one does not jump out at me right now. Um, so I, I can't think of a of a of a general uh, audience book about pain right now. So uh, uh, certainly on, on neurology, I, I recommend any of the books by Oliver Sacks. Uh, mm -hmm. Oliver Sacks has some wonderful books about uh, neurology and some of the unusual. Uh, conditions about uh, about that happened to people with uh, neurological disease. So any books by neuro, uh, by Oliver Sacks, I would recommend uh, a general book on neuroscience. Uh, in addition to to mine, uh, David Eagleman has a great book that you might uh, want to look look for as well. They also might have a, a few specific topics about uh, pain as well. So I would, I would recommend those. Oh, thanks, Eric. Maybe maybe that should be your next book then, if there isn't uh, if there isn't one that comes to mind. Okay, next question uh, from G, uh, who says, "I read that following a brain injury, the brain often switches from glucose to ketone bodies as its source of energy while it recovers. Is this common? And if so, is there an impact of diet on brain health disorders or repair?" Uh, yes, that's an interesting question. Uh, so that's not a, a particular area of my research, so I, I can't comment about how the brain changes its source of, of uh, energy. So I, I don't know the answer to that question. Uh, but certainly, uh, there is an impact of diet on, on brain health disorder and disorders. So we do know that particular diets can be beneficial to good brain health. Um, there's been some work on, for example, you may have heard of the Mediterranean diet, uh, so fruits and vegetables, but my, again, I'm not a clinician, so I, I can't comment uh, on any personal uh, health, but there is data to suggest that, uh, that certain types of diets, for example, that Mediterranean diet may be beneficial. Uh, certainly, we also get some of our, our, our developed brain chemicals from the food we eat, so it's very important to get a balanced diet. Uh, to uh, to keep our brains in, in our best shape. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, so our, our next question, we've actually got two people who've asked almost exactly the same thing. Uh, so David B says, I'm really fascinated to hear what you think the uses of AI might be in your field. And the following question is, how do you think artificial intelligence will affect developments in neuroscience? Yes, uh, great question. Very, very topical, very timely. Uh, yes, so uh, neuroscience is already uh, being impacted by AI. And I think that one of the biggest uses of AI will be in helping with data analysis. That is recognizing patterns, uh, recognizing patterns in brain imaging, recognizing patterns in what we call spike activity. So neuroscientists can record from hundreds, if not thousands of neurons at one time. And that's a tremendous amount of data. Well, artificial intelligence will be a tremendous value to process those data, look for patterns, and try to get an idea of what those data mean. So it, it will probably be helping in the clinic as well. So you can present a, a brain image or a sequence of brain images, let artificial intelligence try to interpret what those data mean. And I think that's what's going to be a, a tremendous impact of AI on the field of neuroscience as well as neurology. And on medicine in general. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. And I mean, it, it's certainly it's something that actually probably for about the last 20 years, MRI researchers have been starting to use pattern classification techniques that are a, a subset of AI. So that example that you had in your talk about whether you would be able to tell if somebody was lying, if, if, if that were possible, it would be through one of those sorts of algorithms, I think, wouldn't it? 
Yes. And now, now at this point in time, <laughs> right now, we do not have the ability to use any type of brain scan or reporting technique to tell if someone is lying or not. So yeah. people are working on it. Uh, perhaps uh, by using AI, we'll get better and better at this detection. But at this time, uh, we do not have that ability. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay, uh, we have an anonymous question next. It says, is your work on pain leading to different treatment options for people with chronic pain conditions? Yes, yeah, so I'm at the very, very early stages of some of this uh, research. Um, yes, uh, not only my research, but research going on in labs around the world are all looking for new therapies and techniques to treat chronic pain. Uh, chronic pain is very, very difficult to treat. Uh, acute pain, like uh, uh, broken bones, uh, cuts on the skin, those are relatively easy to treat. But chronic pain causes changes. And uh, like I was talking about how the brain changes itself uh, and rewires itself. Unfortunately, uh, pain conditions rewire uh, the nervous system. And so the getting treatment on uh, uh, for chronic pain is much more difficult than uh, these acute types of pain. But yes, there's been progress being made either surgically, uh, pharmacologically. Uh, there are new treatments and that are being researched all the time. And so I, I hope that within the next few years, we'll have some really, really new effective treatments to treat chronic pain. Yeah, I hope so too. I, I was amazed when I found out a, a year or two ago that the current guidelines uh, in the UK from NICE, which is the National Institutes of Clinical Excellence, so that painkillers, pharmaceutical painkillers, shouldn't be used to treat chronic pain um, because, of course, there are problems with addiction. So I, I think you're right. We desperately need novel treatments for this uh, for these sorts of conditions. Um, OK, we've got uh, quite a, a, a change of uh, tack for the next question, uh, going a bit more philosophical. So I Anderson asks, are you a materialist? What is your opinion on mind and matter versus the soul? So I think that touches a bit on something that you were discussing earlier uh, before the talk started, doesn't it? Yeah, so uh, th that's a, a great question. This will be, uh, I, I should preface this by saying this is my personal opinion. It's not shared by other scientists and, and researchers, but but more my, my personal opinion. Uh, but let me first back up and let me tell you about one other project that I've been involved with for the last uh, 10 or 11 years. For the last 10 or 11 years, I've been invited to go to India to teach basic neuroscience to Tibetan Buddhist monks and nuns. These are uh, uh, Tibetan uh, Buddhist monastics who now live in India because they've been exiled from their uh, country of Tibet. And they live in India. Uh, some of you may know that Tibetan Buddhists have been studying the mind and the brain for thousands of years. Well, Western science has really only studied it for from 100, maybe 200 years. But these are very these are people that have uh, and their their philosophy has asked questions about the mind and the brain for for thousands of years. And they've even invited me to go there. I've been there eight times now in the past ten years or so, teaching basic neuroscience, trying to learn from them as well. Uh, but they have very, very different ideas about how the brain and the mind work. So to get to your question, uh, Tibetan Buddhism, in my very basic understanding of their philosophy, is that the mind is not created by the brain. Uh, my own personal opinion, uh, again, personal opinion, I'll repeat that, is that yes, that the mind is created by the brain. And I, my evidence for that is that when the brain changes, the mind changes as well. And that you can evidence by different drugs can affect the brain. That affects how the, the your, your perception of the world. Uh, drugs, uh, brain injury also affects how our mind works. So that to me is evidence that the mind is created by the brain. The Tibetan Buddhists also believe in reincarnation. And this gets to your question about the soul, that after the brain stops working, that something else continues. Um, I don't believe that science can give us such an answer. As a scientist, I need to design an experiment to test. I don't know what experiment I would do or anyone would do 
to find out if something exists after a person dies. So for that reason, uh, uh, I, I, my answer is, I don't know. And as a scientist, saying I don't know is not a bad thing. I don't know a, 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 an experiment that will give me that answer. So I, I have to say that I'm, I'm open to suggestions. I'm open to evidence. Uh, but unless there is some testable hypothesis, an experiment that can be done to give that answer, I have to stop right there and say, I don't know. So I have a personal belief, but uh, I, I also have to follow that up with, I, I don't know. Good, thank you. Okay, we've got time for just two more questions, I think, uh, that I've got here, and then we'll wrap things up. So Flora Burley asks, do you see a conflict between quantitative data, statistics-based, and qualitative data, experience-based, in the treatment of neurological disorders? Yeah, that's a that's a very, very interesting question. I, I, I don't see a conflict, but rather what I would suggest is that they, they should be used together. Um, I, I don't think that there's any reason why they should be separated, and both can contribute uh, to, to, the, to treatment. So, uh, and, and this actually goes back to uh, uh, my experience with the Tibetan monastics, in that they believe very much so in experience-based uh, and, and, and individualized. Uh, uh, treatment uh, for this. Uh, I was able to talk to uh, uh, one of the uh, Tibetan uh, medicinal uh, doctors while I was there. And everything is very individual and experience-based. Um, but, uh, so I believe that that has something to offer, but quantitative data and statistical analysis, I think also has value. So I don't think that you should separate the two, but rather I think you should combine the two. And I think that in using that, perhaps we would come up with even more effective therapies and treatment. Great. Thank you. OK, and uh, just one more then. Uh, so we've got a, an anonymous question. I have read about how culture can impact how patients perceive their own early signs of psychological disorders. Is there evidence of how ethnicity or culture can impact neurology? It's a really interesting yeah, that's, uh, that's a, also a great, great question. Uh, the answer is yes, uh, people have been studying that. Uh, in fact, I'll relate this back to a previous question about pain. So in different cultures, uh, they experience pain differently. So the same stimulus can cause completely different uh, behavior responses. Uh, so there are some cultures that it's, you should be very stoic and not express that, while there are other cultures that it's okay to cry and, and show emotion. So there are there data to suggest that culture does uh, uh, tremendously impact uh, psychological well-being, uh, psychological treatments. Uh, also, uh, many of you have probably heard of the placebo effect. Uh, and that is, uh, uh, even though someone might be given a completely inert substance, it can still have an effect. Well, uh, that part of that has to do with culture. If, if, if uh, the person in the white coat is telling you that this particular treatment will work, it will work. And in some cultures, the placebo effect is very, very strong. Uh, in other places, uh, not so strong. So I, I think that um, culture can have a tremendous influence on how psychological and even neurological uh, disease is expressed. Wonderful. Thank you very much. So. Um... I think uh, that will that will do for questions. And I think we've got to the end of the questions, actually. So that was perfectly timed. Uh, so first of all, just a, a huge uh, thank you to Eric for giving us such an interesting and entertaining talk uh, this evening. Um, I don't think we can hear everybody clap, but I'm sure everybody's expressing their appreciation right now. If anyone would like to purchase a copy of Eric's book, Neuropedia, I've got mine here, uh, has a, a lovely big brain on the front end. I think, Eric, did I read this correctly? That um, is it a relative of yours that's done the illustrations? Uh, yes, my daughter, who's a freelance illustrator and musician, did the illustrations for me. Fantastic. They're, they're, they're really great. Uh, so um, copies of that book are available from our partner bookseller, Fox Lane Books. Um, and so if you'd like some more information about that, um, there is a link on the festival website uh, that will take you to the, the website and, um, uh, and you can uh, get a copy of that yourself. 
Okay, uh, so thank you everybody for coming along. Uh, we've been really well attended uh, this evening. Um, and thank you all very much for engaging with such interesting questions. Uh, they were very wide ranging and, uh, uh, and stimulating. Um, okay, so uh, thank you all very much for coming. And thank you very much, Eric, once again, uh, for such a fantastic talk.